Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. In the United States, the strategy for recovery seems to be get more competitive. What does that mean? It means lowering wages. And if you get more lower wages, you can have more of an export economy. President Obama advocates that. Candidate Romney advocates that. The problem is, what if every country's lowering wages? Then what? Now joining us to talk about the effects of all of this and the increasing global recession is Heiner Flassbeck. Heiner serves as Director of the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies since 2006 for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. He was a Vice Minister from October 98 to 99 at the Federal Ministry of Finance in Bonn in Germany and he was responsible for international affairs and the IMF. He joins us now from Geneva. Thanks very much for joining us, Heiner. Hi. So you just issued your annual report for 2012, and it's essentially it's a report about inequality. But it's not just that inequality is not fair. The point of your report is this, this supposed drive to competitiveness and, and lower wages is actually at the root cause of the problem of the global recession. It's not just that it's, not, that it's unjust. So talk about why you think this is the case. Well, we have uh, the situation that uh, we have uh, falling wage share in most of the developed economies in the last 20 years. It was, so to say, the recipe to deal with all the shocks that we had, with the oil shocks. Everybody said all the time, so uh, make your labor markets more flexible. And uh, more flexibility clearly means if you have high unemployment, uh, cutting wages and cutting wages in relation to profits and cutting wages in relation to productivity. So this was the recipe the, of the Washington Consensus and uh, all uh, international uh, institutions. And um, this has led to a situation uh, that uh, where we are in now, where, so to say, the world economy is stuck and do not, does not have the economic policy instruments anymore to get uh, back into recovery. Let me explain that uh, briefly. Take the United States. Uh, in the United States, the wage share is also very low. Everybody talks about high degree of inequality in the United States, but at the same time, unemployment has jumped, and, uh, but it has jumped not due to high wages before, but it has jumped due to the financial crisis. But now you have high unemployment that puts pressure on wages because the power is in the market and the labor market such that uh, uh, wage earners have nothing to, to, to negotiate for. And uh, so they put pressure on wages. If wages fall, incomes fall for the average uh, American household. And if incomes fall, consumption will fall. If consumption falls, investment falls, and the econ economy will not get out of recovery, but deeper into recession. So this is, this is obviously a big problem with the market economy, because every good economist would say, well, if you have unemployment, then there should be pressure on wages. But if wages have never risen before, and there's nevertheless unemployment, then you're in trouble uh, somehow. And that is why. Uh, the president and others will uh, have uh, big, big difficulties to get out of the slump. And that is why monetary policy does so desperate things as they're doing now. Well, when President Obama was dealing with the crisis back in 08, 09, uh, and, and now in his campaign, the sort of jewel in his crown is what he said was the saving of the American auto industry. But to a large extent, that saving was based on lower wages. Uh, starting workers get $13, $14 an hour. I'm hearing even as low as $9 an hour in sectors of the auto industry, where they used to make $25, $26, $27 an hour. Uh, and, and they're trumpeting this as the model for recovery. Yeah, but if the, the problem is only the small problem, to be ironic, uh, is that uh, if you have an economy with an export share of 10%, uh, by cutting wages you can get more uh, competitive, but uh, you really uh, have a situation where uh, the, the tail is wagging the dog and uh, you get more losses uh, inside the economy than uh, you can gain outside. And uh, in addition, not everybody can improve uh, its competitiveness in this world because competitiveness is a relative concept and not an absolute concept. So everybody can increase productivity, but not everybody can increase competitiveness. So there's a big misunderstanding all around the place. Uh, in Europe, is exactly the same. Uh, and you have examples now in Europe where countries have cut already their wages by 20%, but nevertheless, their economy is collapsing. Uh, take the southern European countries, there the export share is 25%, but if you kill 75% uh, of your economy uh, to save the 25%, it's not a good uh, bargain. Uh, I mean, and the point you're making in the report is that, as you say, competitiveness is relative. So if all your competitors are doing the exact same thing you're doing, lowering wages, then it's that you're not really gaining an advantage, but what you are doing is sucking even more demand out of the global economy. 
That's right, and uh, there are only very few exemptions. If you took, uh, take my own country, Germany, uh, Germany was successful, so people say uh, up to now it was successful uh, because uh, it cut wages, but it only under the historic uh, unique circumstances of the monetary union where all the other countries did not retaliate. That was a successful policy for some time, but now, unfortunately, Germany, Germany's clients are all uh, bankrupt, and if you have uh, policies that make your clients bankrupt, it's not a good idea. Uh, now, the other argument that's he heard here is that the real root cause is not anything to do with demand and wages. It has to do with the deficit and debt. You say that's not true. Yeah. Uh, what, what is government debt? We have to look a bit again at the overall economy, at the macro picture. And the macro picture is that you have in many countries now, you have private households are saving because they are uncertain about their future, because they have no wage increases, so they're saving uh, for precautious reasons. Uh, the company sector is making still uh, quite a bit of profit, so they're saving also, and uh, the government uh, tries to save also. So wh what is happening in an economy where everybody tries to save and nobody's going to spend? Well, the answer is very simple. This economy is going to collapse in a very short time. Or you find someone for the global economy, you find the Venus or the Mars we can trade with. That's the only the only way out. But uh, if that is not uh, feasible, then uh, we are stuck. And that is where we are. We are stuck. Uh, monetary policy has run out of instruments and of uh, weapons, so to say, to fight the slump. Fiscal policy is blocked politically and uh, in wages, by, in, in terms of wages and uh, the labor market, we're going in, the, going in the wrong direction. So there is no surprise that we cannot get out of recovery. Unfortunately, and this is the big problem that we have, uh, most of my colleague economists still stick to the idea of a self-regulating, self-stabilizing labor market. As long as they do, we will not understand what is really going on. And what's wrong with that idea? Well, as I said, it's, it's wrong uh, if you have a jump in unemployment at the lowest level of wages that we ever had, uh, then the idea is definitely wrong, because the idea is based on uh, the theory that uh, if wages rise, unemployment rises. But if wages are low and wage, wages are falling and unemployment rises, then this idea is wrong. And then the, the power of the employers in the market is going in the wrong direction, namely in wage cuts, which destabilizes the economy, that destabilizes the economy downward, so we're getting in a downward spiral that nobody can stop anymore, even monetary policy cannot stop. Look at the discussion that they had in Jackson Hole, the, the central bankers of the world, and some people have understood it. Donald Cohn, a former vice chairman of the Fed, said there must be something deeper uh, that is going on in the market. And he's right, something deeper. The something deeper is that we have a distribution uh, of income between labor and capital that going in the wrong direction for 20 years, and now is, is the point of reckoning, so to say, where we have to understand this or we uh, go into a Japanese-like st stagnation for the next 20 years. So this, the answer from Ben Bernanke and the central bankers, uh, the American, the Canadian, particularly the Europeans, the Japanese, uh, they're all saying, okay, then that we need a f one form of quantitative easing or another. The banks are simply going to inject, the central banks will inject more liquidity into the, into the banking system, and that's supposed to give rise to growth. No, that's that the only thing that that will do is it, if, if they're lucky, uh, then they will pump up another, another bubble. Uh, and a bubble may help because it gives the people the illusion that they're getting rich. But this would be the same game that we have done 10 years before, and I think we should not repeat it. But even this is very improbable at this moment of time because we are now uh, Europe, the United States, and Japan being in exactly the same situation, namely close to stagnation or going into recession. And uh, we see that quantitative uh, easing has been helping not at all. Up to now, it has not been helping. And even the very unorthodox measures of the, of the, of the Fed that I, that I uh, welcome very much uh, because uh, the Fed does what it can, but it cannot do enough. That's absolutely clear. And if the fiscal cliff comes now at the beginning, <laughs> what is called the fiscal cliff at the beginning of January in the United States, uh, then you're really in trouble. And I think Ben Bernanke understands quite well that he cannot complement, uh, compensate for the, for the fiscal cliff. The theory you hear from supporters of austerity, especially in North America and Europe, is that the real markets are going to be in the developing world. And what has to happen is that the production has to get uh, more competitive in Europe and North America, not so much necessarily vis-a-vis -vis each other, but vis-a-vis -vis the developing world so that they can take advantage of that growth. And that's where the, sa the savior of the system is going to come from. 
Yeah, but then the global tail is uh, wagging the, the global dog. Uh, again, it's uh, the developing countries altogether are much too small uh, to uh, be the engine of growth for, uh, as I said, Japan, the United States and Europe as a whole. Uh, this is something like 65% or so uh, of the world economy, so you cannot expect countries uh, like China or even India to, to move the world out of recession. It's absolutely impossible. It's, uh, and, and this fight will not lead to nothing if we cut wages. As I said, w the first thing that we do, we kill our domestic market. And when we have killed our domestic market, uh, even if we would get a little e effect from exports, it would not help us, our economies. We're, we're doing this experiment. This experiment is running at this moment of time in Southern Europe, and it's badly failing. You see, since three years, uh, the, the countries in, in Southern Europe are cutting wages. Greece has cut by 20%, Spain is cutting by 10%, Italy is in, on, on the path to cut. But where they have cut, it has never worked because, as I said, if you have 75% domestic market that is destroyed by the wage cuts, and this is the immediate effect of the wage cut, the people are stop, uh, stop consuming, uh, then uh, whenever you reach after three, four years' time uh, the level of competitiveness uh, in Europe vis-a-vis -vis Germany, uh, uh, your, your system is destroyed and your, your political economy is destroyed and your democ democracy maybe uh, is destroyed. I did a, a, a little experiment at the Toronto G20. I went through the final declaration and I tried to find the word wages. I couldn't find the word once in the whole declaration, which was supposed to be this vision for the decade on how to get out of the crisis. Uh, th this isn't even on the agenda of, of the policymakers that wages should go up, except maybe they hint at it occasionally that the Chinese should have wages go up, but, but certainly not in their own countries. Uh, what are you finding when you talk to policymakers about this? Well, it's difficult to talk to policymakers, no doubt, because then we have just the experience here in, in Geneva. It's very difficult to make them understand what's going on because they're all uh, grown up with the idea the labor market is a market, is a normal market. But uh, if you explain to them that's not a normal market, then they are shocked. And that is what all good uh, economists, as I said, uh, tell them all the time, that the labor market is a market, and if the unemployment goes up, there has to be pressure on wages. It's it's a, a clearly wrong this time, but it's very difficult to emancipate from this uh, old uh, uh, and uh, uh, idea that has been engraved, so to say, in the brains of economists for for a hundred years, uh, that the labor market is instable. It's terribly instable, and this is what we have to understand. The government has to do something about it, but if the government blocks its own instruments. Uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy, then there's only direct intervention into the labor market, call it incomes policy or whatever, uh, how the government can stabilize the economy. Otherwise, it would go into deeper recession or will stay in stagnation, as I said. Okay, in the next part of our interview, we'll talk more about why this is happening and what can be done about it. Please join us for part two of our interview with Heinrich Flasbeck.